with um, asking you whether you have any questions about the second homework, which is due this uh, Thursday, more like conceptual questions that are, you know, maybe shared among all of you. Yes, please. Well, looking at the deep form neural network example, if you pass in the length of your like initial feature vector, mm -hmm. and that just leads me to believe that we're going to be passing in the length of the entire like vocabulary to go in and then adjust it that way. I, I don't see the, like I feel like there's a more clever way of doing something like that. Sorry, can you clarify? Like length of the input is not the number of words in the vocabulary, so. Oh. It's the it's the maximum possible sequence length uh, that you can determine by you know checking what is the maximum sequence length you observe in your input. Um, and the reason why we even check this is because we are going to do batches of data. And as I mentioned last week, we want to produce like a structure that's going to be easier for us to work with. And it's easier if we have. Um, each one of these lists of token IDs being the same, then we can do easier lookup operation and everything else kind of becomes easier, not necessarily easier to implement, but more elegant and more efficient. So that's what the input length is referring to. Yep. We are creating that development, I think not creating or furthering. Yeah, I don't remember what exactly the uh, homework instructs you to do, but you can either freeze it or not. You can treat those as another set of weights. I don't remember what exactly the homework is saying. You can, you have those two options, unless the homework says freeze them, then absolutely freeze them, yeah. Yep. Um, I, I submit to Grace Hope without like, um, doing the submit thing is giving me like 99.5 points just how it is. Oh, sorry, say again. I, sub I submit to grade scope just without part three uh -huh. the credit part, and I'm getting like 19 out of 25 on the extra credit. Oh, I see. So without submitting anything for the extra, you are getting some points for the extra. Okay, thanks for that pointer. I will uh we'll check it out and, and make sure that's fixed. Uh yeah. Could it be that you're getting 99 for your rest of your homework? Because if you had submitted homework, then you would get 125. Well, I was getting like, it said like a 70% accuracy on my. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh, so you shouldn't be. Okay. I will check it out after. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, then let's move on with our next topic. Um, and yeah, we released the grades for the first assignment. As I said there, um, if you feel like anything had been done unfairly because of the whole uh, grade scope runtime taking longer than locally, please reach out, open uh, regrading requests in grade scope. Also come to the office hours. We are happy to go over our solutions with you and answer any questions you have. Uh, I'm not going to directly share the solution such that we can later on reuse these assignments with uh, smaller smaller tweaks. Okay, uh, good. Then uh, let's get uh, uh, on with our uh, transformers uh, or like trying to learn about transformers. So last time we talked about machine translation and then we build up to neural machine translation. And what we have learned is basically a language model that's conditioned on some um, a target, uh, on, some, on the source sequence, right? Uh, so we use that idea from neural language modeling, and then we applied it to machine translation and to these sequence-to-sequence -sequence approaches. We had our uh, encoder, RNN, that had uh, learned the representation of our source sequence and that representation, that single fixed size vector had to capture all of the contents that we have in our source sequence. And that fixed representation was then passed to the decoder and the decoder is then uh, generating token uh, by token. Um, the issue with this approach turned out to be that this idea that one single vector should um, should capture all the information, all the useful information in a, in a single vector uh, turn out to be suboptimal, especially when sequences are very long, then there is more information to capture and more long range dependencies between words uh, in the sequence. 
Um, so this, this turned out to be a bottleneck. And what we're going to learn now first is uh, a, an approach to fix that, uh, that bottleneck. And that approach is called attention. Attention was first proposed in this massively important uh, paper, and I rarely spell out, you know, the titles of uh, of the papers I share. But I think this is the one you should be uh, remembering. And core idea behind the attention is that on each step of our uh, decoder, when we are decoding next work, we are going to use some kind of connection to the encoder and uh, kind of use this connection to tell the decoder at that particular time step, hey, maybe you should, because you're at this time step and you're decoding this word, um, maybe you should be focusing more on these uh, tokens in the source rather than some others. And then when we come to the next uh, next time step, we might decide, oh, some other, other source tokens are more, more important. So you're kind of, while you're decoding, you're also capturing which tokens are currently very important. That's the core idea behind uh, attention. Okay, I will go, I'm going to show you a sequence of illustrations to show how this works. And I'm going to be placing equations uh, at uh, certain places. I'm not going to repeat those equations later on. So when you are coming back to these slides, have in mind that uh, these equations are uh, spread throughout these slides. Okay, so this is again our RNN here, one that it is encoding uh, encoding uh, source tokens. At each one of these steps, at each token of the source sequence, we have a hidden representation, age i. Um, and then here we have our decoder hidden state that is a representation of the current uh, token over here, which is the start of decoding sequence. Okay. Now with attention, we are going to make a dot product between our decoder hidden representation and our um, uh, encoder hidden representation at each one of the encoder uh, tokens. So at age one, we are going to make a product between ST, which is here S1 and age one. At age two, we are gonna make a dot product between age two and again, ST or S1 in this case and so on. So at each one of these hidden states, we are going to get a scalar value because dot product gives us scalar value. And remember, throughout this course so far, dot product always signals some kind of importance uh, between the uh, you know two vectors. If the dot product was high, these things were connected to each other, right? That said, um, I'm going to show you the standard form of attention with dot products. It is not the only form of attention. So sometimes people will be here to produce this important scores between the current hidden encoder state and the current decoder hidden state will use some other um, you know, mathematical uh, computations, usually very simple arithmetics, but they might vary slightly. So if you end up reading some paper, and they and use slightly different version, that shouldn't throw you off. You will, for yourself, conclude, uh-huh, this is still important, it's just computed slightly differently. But today we are gonna use dot products, which is very standard basic form uh, of attention. Okay, as I said, you are going to, for a given decoder hidden state, S1 here, you're going to repeat this on every hidden encoder state. So we are repeating this dot products and we are getting for these four encoder uh, steps for four source tokens, we are going to get four values EIT. All right, so we have computed that for every source token. And as always, we are going to take softmax to normalize those important scores we have computed to something that's between zero and one. So here, here we have produced uh, a sequence of four uh, numbers, and we are going to put that four numbers into a vector called E T. In, uh, e, um, it doesn't matter, but T stands for the current decoder step. So this is actually E1 over here. So you have vector, this vector is of the length capital N, which for me denotes the sequence of the source, um, the, excuse me, the length of the source sequence. So number of tokens in the source sequence. And then when we apply softmax, which we have seen it a number of times now, 
that means that every single value in this uh, vector is going to be exponentiated and then normalized by other values. And that's how we produce the zero to one. You might wonder, well, is this necessary? I, I would say it is for two reasons. One is that when you go from sentence to example, to exa from one example to another translation example, this course might vary a lot. And uh, what was really, really important for one example might be, I don't know, 10, but what was really, really important in another example might have been just three. And you want to kind of have this normalization to, to make those values comparable across examples. And also, usually when we apply softmax, things become uh, easier to train, just the stability of training is better. So you have applied softmax, and what you have now produced is kind of for a given decoder step, you have produced a distribution over your source tokens that tells you how important those tokens are for decoding the next work. Okay, uh, so you might like, because languages, we can, we, we've talked about word-to-word -word alignment. One thing you can already expect is that, um, that certain, you know, like if this was the first word in the source, maybe the first word in the coder step is gonna, like the first, excuse me, if we are decoding the first word in our target sequence, likely around first um, tokens in the source sequence is where we should put a lot of, uh, you know, um, importance weight in this distribution. But we have also seen that we can't always do word-to-word -word alignment and then need to opt for phrase alignment. So you might imagine somewhere, if we are trying to now decode the third word in our decoding step, somewhere around third, uh, third token in the source sequence, we might see importance, but not all of it will be exactly on the third uh, token in the source sequence. Okay, uh, any questions about this? Yes, please. Okay. Yes, uh, mentioned, uh, it seems a bit redundant because the final step of encoder already contains uh, all the previous hidden steps. So, mm -hmm. why are we doing it? Yeah, so as I said, this idea that one vector should capture all of this information turned out to be empirically uh, false. Like, empirically, we have seen that this vector is not sufficient. Um, so we need to do this because the longer our source sequence is, there is going to be a loss in information. Like we are not going to be able to cram all of this information in a single vector. So there is a dissonance between theory, like all of this should be in this vector, and what actually happens in the practice. So then like, why are we even including the previous historical information from previous tokens? Huh. They're already computing the arrangement each token. Mm -hmm. Why do we need well, we need this represent hidden representation as well, right? Like attention depends on having to to start with some reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, representation of the history so far. So if you didn't have these representation, your attention also wouldn't work. So you can think about first I'm making some reasonable uh, representations, and then I'm going to improve them even further. But you need both. It's not like one um, can work without the other. Does does this make sense? Because the, the, the attention is the product of the encoder hidden representation and decoder hidden representation. If you had reused random representation, you wouldn't get good important scores, so that wouldn't work. And without important scores, we have empirically find out that that's going to be insufficient. And maybe we can use this one neural network that shares the parameters for all the sequels and use the representation for um, from, from that. I mean, in the in a way, these all of these are the parameters itself are are shared, right? Like we are applying the same computations here. We are just applying them recursively. So I don't know what else would you like to share here. Yeah, maybe that step was lost. That we are when we are doing recurrent neural network. It's not like at every step we have another neural network. Uh, these weights are shared. But then they are ruled uh, across different different time steps. Okay, cool. So um, we have our attention distribution. Um, you will hear people usually referring to this important scores as attention. More maybe precise would be attention distribution. 
Once you have that, what you want to produce now is a, is a version of your input source sequence that's tailored toward predicting this next word at this given time step. So what you're going to do is take the weighted sum of these hidden representations where the weights are determined by attention scores you have just computed. So that means whatever attention score is here times the first hidden representation plus this uh, important scores times this representation plus and so on, which is uh, written here with this formula. And this is called attention output or you will hear context vector as well. So just to repeat, once you have computed attention scores, you are going to take the weighted sum of hidden encoder representations. And that's going to be a representation of a source sequence that's tailored toward the given time step in our decoding. In an original paper that has introduced this, they have then taken this new attention output AT and concatenated it with the uh, decoder hidden state at that time step. Concatenation just means that you basically append one vector to another vector. So it becomes a vector of which is two times of the larger size than the original vector we have started with. So I previously used uh, H to denote the size of the vector. Now, now we have time to times to H. And everything else that we have learned last time stays the same. The output vector is going to be, output matrix is going to be slightly larger because now we have words in a vocabulary times 2H rather than words in a vocabulary times H, so times a two times larger matrix. But everything else is uh, exactly the same. Now you have this new representation. You multiply with your output matrix, you get the logits of the size uh, of the number of words in vocabulary. You apply softmax, meaning you normalize them, and you take whatever was actually in the translation as the next word as your gold label, and you use the uh, negative log likelihood to train uh, after you have generated everything. We have said we need to average all of these losses and then I do back propagation. Um, okay, so. Just to be clear, we are repeating this for every single decoding step. So for every every time we are decoding next word, when we're generating next word, we are going to do the dot products with hidden encoder states. We are going to get some values. We are going to exponentiate them, normalize them, get values in between zero and one, uh, then use that to produce weighted sum of encoder hidden states to produce a representation of a sequence that's tailored to the now second uh, decoding step. Same for the third, fourth, fifth, all the way to until we generate end of sequence uh, token. I maybe did not emphasize this before, but when you prepare data for generation, you need to append special tokens to beginning and end, beginning of sequence and end of sequence. Otherwise, your model might never learn to stop uh, generating, or it might not. It might learn to stop generating. Maybe it will start uh, producing period. Um, but like as long as you you ask it to generate something, it'll keep generating. So we add these end of sequence tokens. Sometimes they are like they are not really EOS. They might be something else. And as soon as you see that, you stop generating in your code. You say like as soon as you observe this end of sequence token, you stop uh, generating. Okay. Uh, questions about attention mechanism. Okay, so um, attention is great on so many levels. It first solves that bottleneck problem of cramming everything in a single vector where there is a loss of information. If you open the original paper, you can see how as um, they have experiments where they um, do analysis uh, where the source sequence length is longer and longer. And then you can see that the translation uh, performance measured by blue is way higher than uh, without attention. And that's a huge like empirical uh, evidence at the time that this is really, really, really important. Uh, so it, it had boosted uh, N NMT's performance uh, hugely. Um, also, I didn't maybe previously mention that neural machine translation is abbreviated as NMT, which is a very standard uh, phrase. So also something to, to remember. 
It also has been shown that empirically that it helps with that vanishing gradient problem that I mentioned, where due to the our non-linearity, uh, the gradients become smaller and smaller. And because we are multiplying them, we eventually have a zero gradient, which means that we are not changing anything with our SGD. And it also provides some level of interpretability. So uh, when um, for every single decoding step, we had also uh, observed the importance of the source sequence. So you can uh, visualize these uh, importance of course, as you, as you are generating, you can uh, you know, use a heat map to plot their values. And what you get here is something that looks somewhat alike that word alignment or uh, phrase, phrase alignment. So something we had previously, I didn't go over the details, but we had to find a very complicated way to model, now we get, give that, get that from the model on fly. The model simply learns that, indeed, this is an important feature for this task. I need to learn this word-to-word -word and phrase-to-phrase -phrase alignments to be able to solve it. And by using these important scores and visualizing them, we can get some information of what kind of importance, pairwise important scores the model had learned. Um, today in the lecture, we are going to see another version of attention called self-attention and a transformer neural architecture. And uh, in the context of that, uh, but also this kind of attention. Oh no, I touched it. Uh, okay. I don't know why it's so sensitive today. Okay. All right, so I was saying that uh, we get these uh, important scores and that we might inspect them and to get some sense of what the model is doing, which we call interpretability. Um, that said, it's, uh, it's these, these, uh, these visualizations are, they, they have some issues, namely uh, the way we interpret them as people is like this word has been this important for this word and that's why the model had uh, decided this is going to generate this next word. Uh, but underlying these computations, there are some confounders which make this interpretation not as clear. This causal link we are making ourselves, it's, um, it's might not actually be there. And this is some property, uh, this is a property we call in this interpretability explainability world as faithfulness, whether this uh, visualization, our explanation of the model is truly faithful to the model's underlying decision making. And um, there has been a couple of years back uh, a series of papers that started with a paper attention is not explanation, then attention is not not explanation, and a whole huge debate had emerged from it uh, of whether we can use these to really assign any kind of interpretation to these uh, word alignments. And you can, it, that's why this attention is not not explanation paper exists, uh, but you really need to be cautious. And there are better versions of, uh, of this, where you do additional computations, where you can get a more causal interpretation uh, from these visualizations. I, I'm teaching a course on explainability in these deep learning models, and I link here the lecture where I go into the details of that if you are uh, interested to learn more, or, you know, you can always chat to me about all of that. So these visualizations are great and they do tell us something, but be really cautious that you assign 100% um, causal interpretation to these things. That might be... Um, not true, and therefore you might make uh, too strong of conclusions. Okay, so as this the slide's title, attention is great. Uh, it's really, it's really great. It became like one of these general deep learning techniques that you can apply in many architectures, not just sequence to sequence, and you can use it for many tasks, not just machine translation. So a more general definition of attention that we could be using to kind of embrace this view that it's more general technique is that given a set of vector values and a vector query, for us values were those encoder hidden representations. For us query was a given time steps decoder hidden representation. So given a set of vector values and given a vector query, attention is a technique to compute a weighted sum of the values dependent on the query. 
Um, and this might come handy to you if you are doing all sorts of things in this space. You just want to find uh, a representation that um, is depends on on this uh, vec uh, uh, on these uh, set of vector values uh, given particularly for your specific vector that you call query. And when we do this, we also say that the query attends to value. You know, in those visualization, we had our query, which was decoder, decoder in a representation. And then those arrows uh, kind of pointed to the different encoder hidden representation. In that sense, this query is attending to these uh, value vectors. And this is just a repetition of what I said. For us, values are um, encoder hidden states and for our query is decoder hidden states. Um, maybe a few pieces of intuition here. Um, you can also think about this weighted sum as a selective summary uh, of the information that's contained in the values, which again for us are encoder hidden states that are um, where this query vector determines uh, which which of these uh, source tokens to focus on that then determines how the summary will look like. Um, another way you can think about it is that attention is a way to obtain a fixed size representation of an arbitrary set of representations, namely the values dependent on some other uh, representation. And when you read papers, people will use attention with these intuitions in mind. So it's good to have to, you know, know them because people won't always spell out why they had used attention for the problem. You need to know that there is this intuition and that therefore it makes sense to use at the attention in these uh, setups. So because it's a general deep learning technique, um, it has also changed the landscape of neural architectures we used in machine learning in general. In computer vision, a neural network architecture of choice was convolutional neural network. In uh, natural language processing, we have talked about recurrent neural networks, RNNs, and their more um, used version called LSTMs, which I didn't talk about. In speech, we had deep belief nets, and RL reinforcement learning had their own you know, uh, ways of doing all of this. And currently, this is how the landscape of neural network architecture and their like applications of neural networks looks like. This, this figure here is, a, is an illustration or original illustration of the transformer architecture that we are gonna talk about next. And right now, in every single application of deep learning, we use transformer neural architecture. It became one well, status quo for almost everything uh, in this space, which Again, you know how I said when we started to linearize trees and use a sequence to sequence approach for structural prediction, people were disappointed. I think to some extent people are also disappointed uh, by this because you might think, okay, yeah, everything can be modeled with this, like the same architecture and that can give benefits to kind of unify these things. Or you might think, well, like modeling language and vision shouldn't be exactly the same, uh, which are both totally valid uh, perspectives to have. Noteworthy is that um, the uh, attention, the, the transformers has been introduced in 2017. So it's been a while, like since, you know, like the, the, the neural architecture before transformers will, it felt like they are way, the turnaround was way quicker. So it's been, a, it's been around for a while. And currently there are some proposals for alternatives to transformers. So. Maybe this space will change in a in a year or two, uh, and maybe I'm way way too optimistic when I when I say a year or two. But have in mind that there is a whole you know group of researchers who think about alternatives to this that might be uh, more efficient and have all other benefits. All of that said, let's try to decipher this nasty looking uh, figure. Uh, I mean, if you have taken any of my courses, I always mention this anecdote. So sorry if you have seen it before, but uh, in 2017, I was in my what second, third year of PhD and uh, this thing had been released. And, you know, you have these reading groups and you're tired, you're a PhD student, you don't want to now go over all of these details or have other things to do. So I was like, oh, I, I just going to wait that these things died because, you know, there was generative other Zarial networks and they didn't become this huge thing. So 
I was very like, mm, I don't need to learn this. It's not going to become a thing. We are going to learn RNNs. And um, as we have seen in this slide, uh, I was very, very much wrong. And I had to learn this, uh, what this nasty looking figure means. And today you're going to learn too, hopefully. OK, so uh, this figure and this figure represent the same thing. And by now we know what encoder decoders are, right? So first thing to think about is that the original transformer has been introduced as encoder decoder neural architecture. That has also changed. And today we have encoder only, decoder only, your favorite chat GPT is decoder only transformer, but we also have encoder decoder. So it doesn't mean today, if you read, this is a, a transformer based model that is necessarily encoder decoder, but originally it has been proposed as one. And each one of these encoders encoders is actually a stack of so-called encoder blocks or a stack of decoder blocks. That's a single a second abstraction. And each one of these blocks itself is consists of the same layers. These layers are self-attention layer, which we are going to go over in a second, and a feed-forward neural network that you have learned. So the output of self-attention is input to a feed-forward neural network, and then we know what we do. We multiply it with the matrix and apply nonlinearity, and that's it, right? There are a few extra details here. We're going to go over all of them. It's not as maybe simple uh, as it sounds. OK, so I just want to remind you that, as always, when we start with a neural network, we start with some kind of embeddings of our tokens and some kind of static embeddings, meaning they are not contextualized. They are always the same for this token, regardless of what the other tokens in the input are and regardless of whether this token refers to a word that has multiple senses. Um, right now, you can think about it as a word to work uh, vec vectors. I do not recommend that. Try, rather, think about them as just randomly initialized vectors that we are going to learn, uh, because later on we'll see that the dimension of these vectors also determines dimensions of other matrices and vectors in this architecture. And having you know three hundred dimensions here might not be sufficient, and that's the largest word to vector. Uh, embeddings we have, for example. So think about these today as maybe just randomly initialized vectors. For example, bird that we are going to talk about next time, it has 768 dimensional vectors here. So if you need a number, think about randomly initialized 768 dimensional vectors. However, <laughs> when we are done with this encoder here, this encoder is going to spit out a new representation of that token. And that representation will have exactly the same, uh, exactly the same uh, size as our input embeddings. And for me, it's just important that you realize that only in the first layer we have these embeddings as input. Later on, we have the outputs of the previous block as the input to the block. Um, okay, I think that's all I want to say here. So let's go into the self-attention. It's a little bit complicated, a little bit intimidating. And I mean, this is the third time I'm teaching this and it's still very hard to teach this thing. So don't worry if you don't really get every single detail of this. It's the most complicated architecture you have seen. If you haven't seen, you know, if you haven't taken any of deep learning courses or maybe even higher level courses like the explainability course I taught. Um, so self-intention, Let, let's go over it. First of all, self-intention consists of three sets of weight matrices. Remember, weight matrices are those matrices whose numbers stored in those matrices we are learning with training. And we have the, the three sets of them. And similarly to attention I have shown you before, here we want to learn for every single token and for every single uh, token in the input, we are want to learn its pairwise importances with other tokens in the input. And then what we want, we want to update the representation of each one of these tokens, given this information about 
other uh, importances of other tokens to these tokens. So it's very uh, a like idea to attention we have seen before. It's just that now we are not doing hidden uh, hidden state uh, the, in encoder in decoder. Rather, we are just focusing on the encoder. So previously, when we wanted to change the representation of the coder hidden states to kind of take into account what it has paid attention or attended to in the source. Here, even for the source token, we want to that extra level of uh, efficient uh, 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 kind of like uh, ability to 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 see like um, to find this more complex uh, representations that will be enabled to learn all sorts of difficult tasks. So the idea is the same, it's just that we are learning self-attention, meaning the source tokens itself are attending to each other. And to do that, we again need our value vectors. Um, these are the representations that we are gonna change. And we are gonna use query and key uh, matrices to learn those important scores. Okay, so to go over uh, this illustration a little bit slower. Um, first of all, and let me just make all of these visible. Um, we are in our first layer. We are going to represent our input X in a way that we put each one of the tokens as a row uh, in a matrix. So X here is a representation of an input sequence that's only two tokens long. Um, First row here is the bending of the first token in the input, and the second row here is the uh, embedding of the second uh, second token in the input. And if we had third row, it would be for the third token in the input and so on. So that's what we start with. Then we have these weight matrices uh, that we use to multiply our input X width. So here X is the same, but matrices are different. And you get, here query, key, and value. I recommend that you think about query, key, and value as different representations of your input. And they are all obtained with just linear transformations. So what you get here is in the first row of query is again a representation of the first token in the input. And in the second row is the, uh, the representation, another representation of the second token in the input. In your key matrix, you again get another different representation of your first token in the input. In the second row, again, a representation of the second token uh, in the input. So you just get for your every token in the input, now you have obtained a set of three representations. And these representations are going to be used to compute those important scores and to update the representations of the input. And be aware that we do have weight matrices for query, key, and value. But then what we produce are query, key, and value, which are input dependent. So maybe this doesn't seem as an important distinction right now. But for me, it's important to realize that these are the things you are learning. And these are just the outputs of computations. You are not going to learn these. These are the ones you are learning. So these and these. Um, Input representations are also going to be learned just because they are special. Okay, questions about this. I, we are not finished with what self-attention is. This is just a setup for self-attention. Okay, so as I said, the first thing we want to do, our overall goal is to enrich representation of every input uh, token embedding in a way that captures this new representation, captures that some other words in the input are important to uh, this, uh, this word. So think about one linguistic property, let's say uh, subject word relationship. We know that this is an important relationship and we might expect that if we are, at, uh, if you are looking at the subject that is gonna say, okay, verb is really important for me. We expect to this, this kind of pairwise importance. And to get that, what we are going to do is multiply our query and key matrices, key transforms. So here, this number of rows here is the length of the input sequence. And uh, in our key matrix over here, also we had the number of rows being a number of um, words in the input. 
when we do transpose it, then the number of columns is going to be the same as the number of uh, tokens in the sequence. So when we multiply query and uh, key transpose, we are going to get sequence length times sequence length matrix. And in this matrix is what you are going to, uh, is where you expect to find those importances. As always, we are going to apply softmax for uh, just to uh, have the um, values between zero and one. And then there is this term, which is empirically found to be important for stability of training. So you can ignore it. There is no particular intuition behind it. It just serves for the stability of training. Okay, so going step back, here we have produced new representations of our input tokens. And now we have used these new representations to capture the important scores between tokens in the input. That was the reason why we have produced this query and key matrices, just to get these representations that we are going to use to calculate importances. I like having hidden encoder states and hidden decoder states. That's, those were different vectors, right? We have now obtained this, but our goal is to update the representation of every input token having this information in mind. So the next operation we are going to do is take the outputs of this matrix and multiply it with our value matrix. Remember, value matrix is just another matrix where the in each row, representations of each tokens are stored. So when you do this product, uh, you are basically then ending up with rows here that are weighted sums alike we have seen before where you have changed this representation considering how much these other tokens were important uh, for this particular token in this row. So the idea is exactly the same as in the attention we have seen before. You have just updated the values here to, um, uh, to embrace that there are these relationships in the input. So because we are doing this attention among tokens themselves, um, in the input, this is called self-attention. Tokens are attending to uh, basically themselves. Yeah. If uh, if Q and K are both like learned from the input and they're like related to the input, why? What is multiplying do? Like why not just learn one thing? Yeah, that's a great question. Like why do we need three vectors to represent one thing, right? And I would say that. I'm not saying this with 100% certainty, but the intuition I have here is that with having different vectors for the single thing, we are bringing more expressivity to this model. It's just, um, it's it's one of these things we say in this field, like more parameters you have, more things you can learn. And we have seen that with those polynomials, right? So here, uh, for example, you will notice that these matrices are not necessarily symmetric. Uh, so how much query, so how much one token is important to another doesn't mean that that's exactly the same value of uh, you're going to get if you are switch the order. Um, so you have asymmetric relations here, for example, by having different sets for query and keys. And the way I like to think about value is, aha, uh -huh, value is my, I kind of stored it on a side, and now I'm using these to compute important scores. This is how... Uh, query and key weight matrices is going to operate. Their parameters is going to be tailored towards uh, computing uh, important scores and value itself is serving like, okay, now I, when I have this information, let's, let's update it. I use this intuition, but these things are complex and it would take a lot of experiments to just, you know, verify these various intuitions. But when we start building new architectures, usually we start with some of these um, you know, intuitions, and we do so-called ablation experiments where probably the authors have tried, you know, using the same set of vectors because it's simpler, and it probably didn't, uh, didn't work. All right, so um, we have stopped here. And just to repeat it one, once again, oh, sorry. I have a great question. How do we differentiate the 
Oh, that they are not re like redundant in a way. Uh, there is no insurance that there, there will be no redundancy. Actually, what has been shown uh, is that there is a lot of redundancy in the transformer architecture, and there is a whole line of work that tries to produce efficient transformers. Um, so yeah, you can. There is definitely a lot of redundancy. I'm not sure that the redundancy comes from the query and key learning exactly the same representations. Um, and I want to tell you about another redundancy, but for that, I need to cover something else, which I'll come in a second and then I will come to, to this point. Um, but just to repeat to kind of uh, the general idea to hopefully have everyone uh, in the kind of same mindset, we start with our input token, uh, input tokens. Each input token is represented by some vectors. From those vectors, we uh, use our weights to produce three other vectors for each one of these tokens. These new three vectors are then used, two of them are used to calculate pairwise importance scores between each other, which the name self-attention comes from. And then we use this information about which token is important to which token to update each token's representation. That's, uh, that's what we have covered so far. Now, things get a little bit extra complicated because we don't do this once. Again, because we want that expressivity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can think about value metrics. These are in each row are again just representation of the input tokens. And here uh, you are going to maybe it's going to be easier. Let's try to maybe do one of these dot products. It's going to maybe be clearer. If I find my oh, God. here. Okay, so no, today is not my technology day. Okay, uh, let me just try this if it doesn't work. Let's see whether, okay, that's not too bad. Let me just see whether this is gonna work out. No. Okay, so I'll write it on the board and hopefully you can see that. Um, if not, I'll try something else. Okay, so we have um, softmax of this product. That's going to be um, sequence length time sequence length matrix. And um, I will call it A and for simplicity, let's have two by two. So we had in sequence length, that's only two sequence long, the two tokens long. So here we have a two by two matrix. And um, let me see later, we have an example. Here, the example is thinking machines. So that, that's your input. Is uh, thinking machines. So here we have, I will denote them with T and M for T and M over here, and T and M. So here, this number tells us how important the uh, thinking is to thinking and how important thinking is to machines, how important machines to, is to thinking and how important machines is to machines. And then uh, we have our value. This is value. And um, it might have the dimensions here. All right, so we are doing product of these things. So here, uh, first thing we are gonna do is take this value and uh, multiply it with this, which is the first dimension of the vector that represents the first, uh, to first token and then times first dimension of the uh, representation that um, we take this one and then multiply it with this one, which is depending on how much this other token is important to the first token, I'm going to take that much of its first dimension of its vector to combine it here by add adding these two values into the first dimension of the new representation of the 
uh, token for uh, taking. So in this way, we have produced this this here here thing here thing here, um, which now when I when I illustrated like this, I'm not sure whether it came across. So let's just do, do this one more time. We have attention metrics. Um, it tells us important scores between these tokens in the input. In each row, we are going to have a representation, current representation of each one of these tokens. And what we are doing now is producing a new representation of the first token, which will take uh, some information from the representation of other tokens, but it's going to take as much as these importances indicate. So if here we had importance, which is 0.9, really high, we would take 0.9 of the first dimension of the uh, second token's uh, representation and combine it with the uh, first uh, first uh, dimension of the first token's representation. So we are doing this mixing and matching this weighted sum of these representations, just like we did with the attention output with the standard attention before. Uh, oh, a little bit more computation, but we are, th that's the idea. We are building up to this new representation, which is then gonna be the um, input to the next encoder block, but we have a few steps before we get to that. But yeah, that's the general idea. Okay, any questions about this? I'm happy to go over this more times. So I'm sorry, guys, I don't know whether you even see this. Okay, all right, good. Um, all right, so as I said, things get a little bit complicated because uh, we are not going to do this once. And each decoder, each, each encoder block, we are going to do this multiple times. And this is determined by the hyperparameter, which is the number of um, attention heads we are going to have in each encoder block. So this thing is one attention head. And then we are going to have multiple of them. Let's say we have eight attention heads in a single block, which means we are going to have different, this set of three weight matrices is going to be um, number of attention heads times the set of three matrices. So in each one of these heads, we are going to have different matrix, weight matrices over here, but the computation stays the same. If weight matrices are different, of course, then the what we expect these outputs are going to be different as well. And idea is that okay, maybe at this level we need to learn all of these features, and each one of these heads will specialize to learn those features without us explicitly telling the uh, any at any point that the model should be learning any of these different features. And this is where that redundancy comes from. Like we want this for expressivity, for having more expressive power of this model. And it's, it is important, but what people have found out is that these attention heads many times learn exactly very similar representations. So you can ablate or prune some of them, like you can prune some of these heads and you will still be able to, to um, yeah, do the task without any problem. Um, yeah, so there is that. It has also been used as the uh, attention heads were used kind of to say whether something is important. You learn, uh, okay, this head is specialized for this property. I ablated and I see a huge drop in performance and I conclude that that property has been uh, very important. Uh, last year, there is uh, there has been a paper from DeepMind called Hydra Effect that talks about how this uh, ablation study is not uh, not robust because these models have the ability to then uh, recover and start using information from another head. So this whole field of inspecting what's going on with these heads is really difficult and people are still figuring out how to do this in a way that enables us to give more causal conclusions where we are sure that yes, indeed, this was important uh, for, um, for the model. But this is a slight digression. So what we have done so far, we have attention heads. We have produced uh, for, let's say we have eight attention heads as this slide heads. That says that now 
we have learned eight different new representations for every single token in the input. And you are going to combine those uh, representations by concatenating them in the huge sequence. Um, here, there is a little bit of uh, intentional hyperparameter setting. So at the end, we want to have um, dimensions that's the same uh, as the as the one we have started with, with the size of our token embedding. So you want your product of the number of heads you have times dimension in uh, uh, determined by uh, query key value matrices, the number of their columns. When you multiply number of heads with a uh, number of columns in these matrices, you want to get the size of your input embeddings, um, such that this concatenated huge vector is is of the of the same size. Um, once you get this concatenated vector, you are then going to uh, multiply it for extra expressivity with another weight matrix. And that will give you your final representation that comes out of, I mean, final in that encoder block and final just as an output of self-attention. So we did this huge procedure starting for uh, from our input uh, token embeddings. Uh, we had for a certain number of heads, for each head, we had three sets of weight matrices that we use to linearly transform each one of these token embeddings, which are rows in this matrix X, to get new representations. We use two of those new representations to compute importances. And then we use the, the, the representations in the value matrix to update the representations. And then we had gotten uh, new representations from each head, which we had concatenated into a larger vector for each one of these embeddings. And we have multiplied them with weight matrix. Oh, sorry guys, this keeps happening. Okay, so questions about self-intention. Let's try to figure this out if it's unclear. As I said, I mean, it's really intimidating, right? We have made huge progress since feed forward network. So it's fine if you're a little bit confused. Uh, you were first and then you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the last. Uh, the uh -huh. let me just try to get my slides back on. Okay. Can AI take this over and make it useful? Yeah. If the recording works out today, I will be mega surprised after all of this. Come on. Oh. Does someone want to share?
Yeah, I don't know what to do. It doesn't work. Let's try to do this. Okay. Okay, so the question was, the last question was, uh, why are we having this final product over here? And that's just another linear transformation. Why exactly? There, it's just the intuition by people who developed this that giving this extra layer of transformation will be helpful to the model to learn, you know, all sorts of uh, difficult features. So yeah, we are just stacking a bunch of these transformations on top of these representations. And um, as, as we mentioned, some of them are redundant. Yeah. What's the difference between X and R here? Yeah, ignore the R for a moment. We'll we'll come to that. Yeah. But this maybe is the representation of the network. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, um, remember when I talked about feed forward neural networks, I said what, what we are doing with neural networks is transforming our not nice space into something that's, uh, you know, nicer for the models to, you know, learn the decision boundaries. And this is just one of these instances of doing a bunch of transformations to be able to do that with exactly what you said, this uh, specific property of capturing this uh, token to token important scores. So here we have now mixed representations, as, as I talked about here, mixed representations of other tokens to produce a representation of a given token. Now the each one of these rows is a mixed representation of other tokens representations. This is also why when I said visualizations are hard to interpret properly, this is also one of the reasons. Because over here, when we see these plots, I have said, uh huh, word uh, he is very important for becoming agitated. So this is kind of like subject word uh, relationships. But actually, what would be way more precise to say is a mixed or contextual representation of the word he that captures other word uh, representations is important for a contextual or contextualized representation of. Uh, becoming an agitated, but these vectors themselves capture something about other tokens. So it could be that it's not only that uh, represent, you know, he is important to becoming agitated, but also these other, you know, representations as well learn into that, you know, uh, in you into these important scores. So these interpretations are really then hard uh, in the end. Sorry, which is a little digression from from your questions. You're, you're right that what we are learning are new representations that are contextualized. Okay, so now we have learned these representations and uh, remember that uh, transformer architecture wasn't just self-attention. That was just one part in the encoder block. So. Let's let's use let's go over other parts of the neural of this transformer architecture. So here I'm using uh, slides by uh, Lucas Bayer, and we'll go over the whole of this whole uh, illustration, starting from inputs. So I'm starting from the very very beginning again, and then I'll quickly go over the self attention. So we start with our input inputs. Our inputs are tokenized, as we know, and they are going to be uh, tokenized into these subwords. Like uh, here, the detective invest. I don't even know what this. Is. Oh, investigated. The investigated is split into this sequence of uh, subwords that don't have uh, meaning themselves. And uh, we know that tokens are indices in the vocabulary. So each one of these will be transformed into an integer that corresponds to its index in the vocabulary. 
And then each vocabulary is a row in an embedding matrix. And we are doing the lookup operation where we now transform this sequence of indices into a sequence of vectors. And now one important thing with uh, with uh, transformers is this these positional embeddings. So, so far we haven't talked about that. We have for P4 neural networks, we did that deep averaging network that you are implementing where we did not explicitly tell to the model, this is the first, second or third word in the sequence. So you're doing kind of like a bag of vectors representations which might be fun for some tasks, but for many you want that sequential information. And then with recurrent neural networks, this was captured by the fact that we are doing things recursively. So you kind of um, give things to the model in a sequential order, and therefore you are modeling the sequential order. But now with this, again, we are back to these matrix vectors multiplications where we are losing the information about the sequence position. So to circumvent that, because sequential information is massively important, what has been introduced is to uh, not only have embeddings for the contents of the tokens, but also for their position, which is a really wonky idea, I think, uh, where now, uh, let's say you can have thousand sequential, only uh, maximum sequence length you can ever model is thousand you will have an embed embedding matrix where you have thousand rows and each one of these row will be a vector that you're going to learn for a position, for a number. So for a single number like one being a first word in the sequence, you are going to represent it with an embedding of this very large size, 768, let's say, that corresponds to number one. Or I don't know if this is position number 10, you're going to have an embedding for being a 10th position, but again, very high dense vector, which for me, it's kind of, I don't know, so strange to be learning these vectors for the integers themselves. But that's what people do. Uh, and then you sum the vector positional embedding with the token embedding. And that's your actual embedding that you are feeding into the model. Positional embeddings themselves Finding the right ones is an active area of research as well. What I told you has been around for a while to just learn them as any other old embedding, but there are now smarter proposals. Um, so be aware that this space is also changing and be aware and it's important to remember that we are now modeling this uh, position by summing the representation of the position with the uh, embedding that represents lexical semantics of the token. Any questions about that? Okay, so now we have our, you know, first embeddings that we've plugged into our first encoder layer. And we have just learned that we first operation we do is multi-headed self-attention. Um, and again, the idea here is that we just produce a new representation of each one of the tokens that models uh, that's contextualized with respect to representations of other tokens. Like here, we have taken a little bit from the vector of, from the appending of the second token to produce an embedding of the first token. Um, after the multi-headed attention we have covered so far, as I said, we have that feed forward layer. So each encoder block has a feed forward neural network, which just means that as we have learned before, you do linear transformation by multiplying the uh, your representation with the matrix. Then you apply nonlinearity. Here we have GELU, which is just a little extent, like a little improvement over RELU, which was the one where we have an identity function, except for negative values, we had zero. Doesn't really matter from my standpoint, it's just a nonlinearity. And then on top of it, you do another linear transformation. So feed forward neural network here refers to a two layer network. One first layer is non-linear and the other is a linear. So something we have seen before. Why do we do this? Again, we want to have that expressivity. Uh, I think the uh, author here of these slides, he offers this intuition that you can think about uh, this operation as each token pondering for itself about what it has observed 
uh, previously. I mean, sure, we can, of course, have these intuitions, but is this really happening? We don't have an evidence for exactly that. Or we don't have evidence that we are so strongly convinced about in research that we just share it as a common knowledge. There is also some weak evidence that this is where the world knowledge is stored. So I might or not have mentioned this uh, research, um, open research direction where we've tried to find where the knowledge such as current president of United States is Joe Biden is stored. And we want to find it, which means localizing it such that we can, when this changes, update this information without retraining the whole uh, model. We want to be able to do that. How to actually do that is we don't know yet, but there is some evidence that at least with current localization methods we have, that this is where the knowledge gets stored. Also later we will learn about something called fine tuning and we will see that these weights are where the, the weights that actually get changed after lots of pre-training, when we do fine tuning uh, of the model, uh, self-attention weights usually are not changing a lot. These ones are becoming specialized for a given task. Okay, and this is where these huge parameters are. So if you're looking into like these gigantic uh, models, like, um, you know, uh, hundreds of billions of parameters or mixture of model models, then this is where the size becomes huge because we have chosen these matrices W1 uh, in a way that we increase the dimension and then we are gonna decrease it again uh, to have what we need and that's the same size uh, that we started with. So we do that. Uh, some people like to call it one times one convolution. This is just to show that there were some kind of at least theoretical connections between all of these networks. And now we get to the final two like special ingredients and this will answer, I forget who asked, I think you have asked about what's R over there. And this is going to, the R that we have seen before is going to be used for our residual connection. So basically uh, this comes already in ResNets. People have observed that when we do this deep, 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 deep layers, at some point you forget what you have started with. And you don't want that. You don't want to forget what you have started with. So uh, to circumvent that, what you do is a very easy, uh, 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 easy solution, which is uh, summing up your current representation with the first representation you started with. And this is called residual or skip uh, connections, which has been introduced before transformers have become a thing. It's just a thing that has been used here. And final thing that's used that has been shown to be empirically uh, very, very important is so-called layer norm normalization. Uh, originally, it has been uh, done, uh, there, is a, there is a difference between like post-norm or pre-norm. And basically, it uh, depends where exactly, um, uh, what, what are you normalizing? Uh, but I didn't say what normalization itself is. So you, you, you have now some representations, new representations, and then you have their mean and variance. And you are going to recompute this representation such that your representation has uh, a zero mean. So we are just normalizing your uh, numbers in your vectors. And um, how exactly you do it, as I said, is post-norm or pre-norm. It has been shown that uh, pre-norm is uh, better today. So there are also these extra extra steps over here. So that's basically it for the encoder. Um, let me see. We have said encoder, whole encoder is stack of encoder blocks. Each block itself consists of self-attention and feed forward neural network. Uh, Self-attention gives us this representation that's contextualized, where now each token's embedding, have, each token's representation has a little bit of other tokens' representations if they were important for that token. And then we had this feed forward neural uh, layers for these extra transformations. Um, after that, we have said, okay, we might now, we got the new representations. We are not extremely happy because we might have, due to all these transformations, completely got forgotten about the initial tokens representation. So we do this residual connection where we sum this 
original representations with these highly contextualized ones. And then we do layer normalization, which just ensures that the values in these representations are not crazy, that they are uh, that have that they are normalized, which is important for training. And after all of that, you get the actual new representation obtained through that block. And you repeat this as many times as you have blocks in your stack, which can be six or 12, for example, and these days even, even larger. So you do this many times. And as you progress through these blocks, the features you will learn can be become more and more and more complex. So I forgot to put this slide here, but remember how I told you at some point that uh, there is this like re rediscovering the, the uh, classical NLP pipeline. So here we can expect that in, in lower layers, we kind of learn more surface level uh, linguistic features. And then in deeper layer, due to all these transformations, these representations can capture somehow these uh, more complex features. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, we still have things to talk about because we didn't even talk about our decoder uh, blocks, but they are gonna look like very alike our encoder blocks. There's just one quick question. Okay, we have a minute. Oh. So, why do, uh, do stack them on top of them instead of using them at? Oh, one, yeah. Very important point. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. Uh, RNNs are slow and we hate slowness and we hate vanishing gradients. When we do this, we can parallelize things really nicely. So everything becomes way faster and because things are faster, we can scale things up. So now only with transformers, we manage to scale them up to hundreds of billion parameters. And that's where you get models like ChatGPT. Yeah. Okay, thanks.